Welcome back. Welcome back to Fourth Culture Studio, and today we're going to do a demonstration drawing on the schematics for the human head. Uh, for a lecture like this one, you know, I'd like to start by just referring back to the kind of uh, uh, structure of the class where we think about where we're getting our information from. So on the one hand, we think about information from the external world, the visual field, and then strategies of drawing that allow us to break down that information and translate it to the two-dimensional picture plane. And then on the other side, we think about uh, drawing from imagination and schematics as well within that range. So, you know, part of that is just um, thinking about mass conception forms, like if I just draw a square right out of my head and then I add uh, some dimensions to it to make it a cube, that would be what we call drawing from imagination. And here we're going to be relating some of the key features of the head back to that cube. Uh, now that schematic, it doesn't, it's not meant to be something that uh, we would use necessarily to try and capture uh, any kind of figure that I'm drawing from life, but rather <clears throat> it's a simple like list of things that I would check on the model. So we're gonna talk about you know, the rule of three, which states from the bottom of the chin is equal to the, from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of the nose is equal to the bottom of the nose to the top of the nose, gets us to the plane break on the forehead. You know, that rule of three is a, a kind of good um, thing to look for on each individual model, but you know, it really is the, uh, subtle nuances between individuals that really create that like wild, you know, uh, diversity of life, you know, the, the beautiful complexity and, and difference that we see, you know, all around the world. Now, so we want to put that schematic in its proper place, right, as a list of things to look for. And also recognize that we're really creating like a simplified imaginary figure in our own head. Uh, so that it's really um, a kind of guide, you know. Okay, so some other things to, to mention is uh, I take my schematics largely from Robert Beverly Hale and this book, Masterclass in Figure Drawing, is just a fantastic schematic. So if you're familiar with this, then uh, this, is, this is where I draw from primarily. So fantastic text. And let's get started. All right, so to get started, we are going to take the human head and start with a five-eyed cube. Now this, this notion of the five-eyed cube is a really great measurement for figure schematics because it shows up throughout the body if you're using the, the skeleton as a, and the kind of bony landmarks that the skeleton provides. So, you know, it states, it goes, it states that uh, uh, the head is five eyes wide, and then if you just drop, if you take a five-eyed cube and you then drop down, then you get to the pit of the neck. If you stack two more, then you can get the rib cage. If you stack two more, two on either side of the midline, that is, then you can get the pelvis. Uh, it's the width of the collarbone. It's uh, both the height and the width of the shoulder blade. If you take two five-eyed lengths, then you can get humerus. With three, then we can get femur. So it's just a fantastic measurement that lands us on the bony landmarks of the body as, a, as opposed to you know, other schematics that might use, let's say, the, the head as its standard, which tends to uh, land us on fleshy landmarks. So we'll start with a five-eyed cube. And, easy way to take a line and divide it into fifths is if I just find the center and then I find one measurement off that and split Three, four, five. and then I always think a stick is incredibly useful uh, I like this stick because it's a compass. You know, you can find angles. It's great for uh, finding gamut in, a, in your works of art. 
but let's just make our five-eyed cube. All right. So when we're going after a schematic, we're going to start with this five-eyed cube, but obviously if I'm drawing a cube straight on, then it just looks like a square. But we want to remember that this really is a cube that we're relating the figure back to. So that the logic of mass conception is holding here. So what is some of that logic? Well, if I take that cube and I drive a central axis point, you know, then that cube is going to automatically reveal you know, its rotation around that central axis. Also, it's going to automatically reveal, depending on <clears throat> what those verticals are doing, the angle, you know, side to side and front to back. So we always want to think about axis and angle. The um, proposition that's being made here is that if I can draw something very simple like a cube, and then I can remember just a few key points in relationship to the cube, then I can uh, put the cube in any position that I want, relate those simple points, and come up with something that's fairly complex like a, like a figure. Let me grab a Poussin example. So here we have a catalog from a Poussin drawing show that was at the Morgan Library and Museum, the great show that I saw a couple years ago. And, you know, what we can see here is how he's creating this multi-figure composition and relating those figures back to the cube. You know, so it's like it gives the artist a lot of freedom for inventing, you know, a, a figure. If you throw a little bit of knowledge of linear perspective and you can invent figures and spaces together, then it gives you a lot of versatility. So that's some of the idea here. And we would, we would counterpoint that you know, to a drawing like this one where he's really drawing from life. You know, so it's like these things, these things really go together. You know, drawing from imagination and drawing from life go together, even though we're using uh, different principles when we're doing each. And, you know, one of my big things that I would want to stress in the context of this class is uh, how we want to be aware of which of these formal approaches or uh, strategies of drawing that, that you're taking so that then you can have just more control over it. So really I think of you know, these different strategies as ways to build awareness when you're making the drawing because if you want to change your drawing then you need to either change the way you're thinking or change the way you're acting. Uh, that implies that I'm aware of the way that I'm thinking. I'm aware of the way that I'm acting in response to it. So. So mass conception of the cube, we'll also be thinking about the mass conception for a sphere. How do I know it's a sphere and not a circle? Let's put some cross contour lines on it. Uh, some other mass conception forms, the cone, cylinder. Robert Beverly Hale really emphasizes the spool, which shows up in his schematics for the figure occasionally. All right, so next step, we've got our cube. This cube is going to be representing, uh, well, we're going to take a sphere and we're going to stick a sphere in this cube. And that sphere is going to represent that sphere of the back of the skull. You know, so it's this. And then we're going to add an egg form on the front to capture the face. So we'll place a sphere in here. And we'll make this point, you know, one more time. We're thinking cube and sphere, not square and circle. Okay. Part of the way that that influences us is we'll be aware of uh, our position in space as we're making the drawing. So, you know, we think about um, are we working on a height line, are we working on a width line, or are we working on a depth line? 
All right, we're gonna do a front and side view. So we'll call this our front view. And then we're just gonna start off our side view and work them together. Give us some space. Try and make sure we're keeping our cubes roughly equivalent. This will be our side view. And we'll start with the sphere of the back of the skull. Next, we're gonna add a, an oval, an egg form. Oh, let's add that to our mass conception forms. That is going to give us the face. Now to do that, we're gonna add that oval such that it gives us a seven-eyed height. So we'll add two eyes onto the bottom of our cube to create a seven-eyed height. And then in our side view, we're gonna add one eye onto the front of this to give us a six-eye depth. We're then going to bring that egg form one eye down from the top of the cube, which is gonna represent the plane break at the forehead. And we'll make that egg form narrower than the wide point of the skull. And what we're capturing there is just the way that the skull is narrower in the front and our wide point is, is back there on that sphere for the back of the skull. Next, let's uh, put the eye line in. The eye line is going to be half our overall height. And for now, we're just going to mark that out. We'll come back to it in a minute. This is something in terms of those things to check on the model, uh, the eye line is, is super important. You know, what that eye line starts to reveal is it's, um, first of all, it is one uh, proportion that uh, a novice can often miss because uh, if we're really focusing on, you know, um, uh, what's important to us, let the features are, tend to be the thing that's important to us uh, in drawing someone's face because you know that's where we get expression from and that's what we kind of relate to in terms of like who someone is. So if if you're not holding your proportions in check, then you might crop off things in your figure drawing that seem less important uh, in terms of content, like for example the top of the head. But uh, finding that midline uh, will start, will slow us down from making those kinds of mistakes. And then also, it's going to reveal the rotation, you know, of that head. So whether or not this person, you're looking at them from below, or whether or not they're looking up, you know, or, or the converse of that. So, you know, and we'll really be checking, you know, that eye line in relationship to other features. So it's like, as that head looks up, then we'll notice that the eye line moves up, the ears move down. So it's like we're looking at those reference points and um, uh, recognizing how they reveal some of this information about axis and angle. So there's our eye line. Before we put in our eye line, let's start to drop down our midline, another very important line in figure drawing. And of course, in this true front view, it's just going to be a vertical trace. Uh, we're going to work it down on the side view as we go. Um, the importance of the midline in figure drawing is that we want to always put it in and then check things across the midline. 
So as we're making that drawing, if there's any kind of like three quarter view, and then I place that midline in, then it can encourage me to compare, you know, the, the near eye against the far eye. Because the head is, you know, we can imagine it existing in this huge, you know, in a big cylinder. Those eyes and the features from one side to the other across the midline in that three-quarter view, they, uh, first of all, are going to be foreshortened, but they dive back in space even further. It's a more extreme foreshortening because those features are wrapping around the kind of cylinder of the head. All right, so <clears throat> on the side view, we are going to start at the high point. That high point is going to be two eyes or one third on a six eye depth. And we're capturing this point, the high point of the skull. So we'll just bring that midline down, sloping down until we hit the plane break. And then we'll make a more extreme angle there. Then we'll pick up the midline as we start to build in the features. The next measurement we're going to look at is what we call the rule of three. That rule of three states that from the bottom of the nose, which is going to be at the bottom of this uh, five-eyed cube, to the bottom of the chin is equal to from the bottom of the nose <clears throat> to the top of the nose, which is right between the eyebrows, at the top of the glabella, is equal to the top of the nose to the plane break. So that's our rule of three. Again, this is a proportion that we always need to check when we're drawing from life. It's also just a great basis if I'm inventing a figure, a great starting point. Now let's start to place our features. And uh, the approach that we're going to take is we're going to relate each feature back to um, a mass conception form and then uh, throw it in. So we'll take that center rule of three and we'll divide that in half and the bottom half is going to be nasal aperture, and then the top half of that is going to be divided between this downturn plane, which is called the glabella, and then this upturning plane, which is the nasal bone. So we'll start with nasal aperture. And then we'll do a downturn plane and an upturn plane. Downturn planes can take shadow, upturn planes can take light. Now let's talk about the mass conception for the nose. So for the nose, if we take two, well, four cones, and we first take two, and we place some tip to tip, shout out to morning combat, and then we take two more, and stack them end to end right on top. And then with just a little bit of flourish, we can get a kind of passable nose. I might add a little bit of the plane in there and throw that downturning plane into shade. I like to call all the downturning planes of the face Dickinson's triangle. So I don't even remember where I heard that, probably from one of my professors. Uh, but it just talks about, you know, those, those areas of the downturn planes of the face and somehow, you know, we can sometimes miss those things. So it's like that downturning angle uh, of glabella or the downturning angle of the nose or the downturning angle of the underside plane of the jaw. <clears throat> so we always want to look for Dickinson's triangles. All right, now we can place that schematic, 
And then for the rest of the nose, as I'm filling this out, I just use the lines that I made for nasal aperture and nasal bone and glabella to stand in for the side planes of the nose. Put a little light and shade. Maybe we'll throw in a little nasal labial fold. And let's work on side view. So same thing, rule of three. Feels pretty good. We're gonna follow that midline down. Now as we get to the eyebrow ridge, uh, we'll look for a rhythm of a slight upturn angle, and then a front angle, and then we'll shoot back onto a back turning angle. We can see that here on planes of the head man, but that rhythm is going to repeat itself you know, as we move down the features. So we're gonna find it at the tip of the nose, we're gonna find it again at the chin. Let's divide that middle third in half. We're gonna split that between nasal aperture. Then we've got uh, glabella, the downturning plane, and then the nasal bone. Then as we continue down, Sometimes, you know, you'll need to look for, sometimes there's an angle change between the uh, nasal bone and then the cartilage of the nose. It's pretty dramatic, but. And then when we get to the tip of the nose, we'll look for an upturned plane, a front plane, and then a back turning plane. And a little bit of a flourish. Maybe we'll throw in a a little bit of shade. All right. Next, let's place the eyes. We already found the eye line at half the overall height. We already have divided up our five-eyed cube into uh, five equal portions. So we can just use vertical trace and pull those eyes down. And what we'll get is that five-eyed width with one eye in between each of our eyes. Now for our mass conception, we're going to start with, we're going to start with the sphere. And then we're going to put the iris on that sphere, quite large. And then we'll find the pupil. And then we're going to think about wrapping the eyelids like thick pieces of clay, you know, just like wrapping around that sphere. So as we're doing that, we're thinking about a cross, you know, a cross contour line. Upper lid, or just shoot for just maybe even overlapping the iris a little bit. I mean the pupil a little bit. Think about wrapping it around. Lower lid, we'll bring that to just just at or below the iris. And then that lower lid is gonna shoot under the upper lid. And we'll feel out that thickness. You know, often you're gonna get, because that lower lid is an upturning plane, often you'll get a little light band right there. Place that lower lid in. Might put a little shade on it. Feel that thickness of the upper lid. Then we're going to place in this convex concave kind of form called the eye cover fold.
and you really want to just look at what's, what's that eye cover fold doing on your any particular model. Now we can continue to apply value to that just using you know what we know about the logic of value. You know, so let's let's throw that in real quick. You know, so if I was drawing a, a sphere with a cast shadow, and then I have a direction of light. My first division in terms of value is always going to be light side, shade side. Remember, this is kind of the breakdown we were seeing in the Poussin. So a study for any uh, figure composition or any composition you're working for, doing a study of the breakdown of light and shade is a fantastic way to start to be able to compose in light and shade and get that uh, visual element to uh, uh, do something in the image, you know, to really support and start to even generate the visual idea. So once we get light side, shade side, then we'll take our light side and we want to divide it into three values, our highlight. Now, I've got a slight tone on this paper so I can grab this white charcoal. If I've got you know, this kind of material and uh, representing my lightest light, then I'm gonna find, when I find that highlight or whatever the lightest light is in my drawing, then I'm really gonna load up that material and find, find its material limit. The same thing with my darkest dark, right? You wanna go out to the two extremes of your range, lightest light, darkest dark, darkest dark, and then that can really help in generating the context for value, which is, you know, everything needs to be down from your lightest light or up from your darkest dark. So what that encourages us to do is then I can start to grow that light side or light shape out of the highlight. But I want to realize that that light side needs to take some kind of tone. So we've got our highlight, our light, then we'll have a transition edge. Let's transition with a 2B. Maybe we can try and put these lines as cross contour lines. If I'm using a cross contour line, then I get two things at once. I'm building up the value, yes, that's true, but then that line as a cross contour line reveals some of the volume itself, right? Because a cross contour line is a line over a conceived form. Um, which is exactly what we're doing with these mass conception forms as well. Okay, so two in the light plus a transition edge. Then we want to find two in the shade. So we've got our transition edge and then we've got our core shadow. And then we've got A reflected light. The way the reason we're getting reflected light is this light from our source is coming down and bouncing off these other planes that are around it or other objects that are around it and then bouncing up into the underside of that. And let's drop it down enough. And put in our darkest dark. And there we have it. And to fill it out, we want to recognize that we've got to get, if we want a value drawing to read, then we need to think about the context. That was core shadow, reflected light shadow. One, two, three, four, five, six parts of light. All right, so let's hit that eye again, thinking about our value. When you're drawing and painting people's eyes, 
we want to watch for how some of our um, unquestioned assumptions get built into our image. One of those things is like leaving the whites of the eye as just a lightest light in our drawing. In this case, if I take my highlights and I've got a material that can bounce them up a little bit, then suddenly I've automatically got a little bit of a tone uh, to my lights. Find another highlight on the meniscus. All right, maybe we'll throw in the tear bag. All right, so responding to use of value. Let's place those eyes in. We'll leave one eye without eyelids and have a flayed figure over there. Okay, partially flayed. On that side view, we're gonna come back one half an eye back from the back of the glabella to place that eye on the side view. And, you know, we'll wanna, we'll wanna recognize that the iris, you know, is a lens. Right, so actually you get a little bit of refraction because it's a lens as that light comes through. If I've got my highlight here, you know, you might get a little bit of light refraction that jumps across the lens to give you the, a lighter kind of section on your opposite side of the, iris from your highlight. All right, let's place that. I will capture a little bit of the sense of the iris. Now our upper lid has a tear duct in it. So it's gonna be a little bit thicker than our lower lid. Cover fold. And what that does for us is it creates this back turning angle on the eye. So we want to look for that back turning angle. We'll look for it down here on the lips as well. Okay, eyes done. Next, Let's put the mouth on. So we're gonna find that midline of the mouth at one third, that lower rule of three. One third from the bottom of the nose. We can take a vertical trace from the center of the eye, center of each eye. That'll give us the corners of the mouth. It's also going to give us a two, two eyes wide mouth. Let's think about the mass conception for the lips. So we'll start with a sphere for the upper lip and then two ovals for the lower lip. And then we'll give it just a little bit of a flourish
Filtrum. That upper lip is going to be a downturn plane. We can think about that mass conception as we're shading. Column of the jaw, filtrum. All right, let's place that. Well, another thing that we would want to think about, you know, to come back to that notion of the, <clears throat> the head, this kind of cylinder feeling of the jaw as it's, as, you know, it's a wrapping around your mandibles. that axis and angle of your cylinder is going to dramatically affect the way that that midline feels. So here we're looking at that cylinder from above, so that midline of the lips is going to be, you know, concave to the bottom, but arcing down just a little bit more. Versus, you know, so if we had... We can see that. Versus if we had, you know, we're looking up at the figure, that head is thrust back. Then that midline is going to react accordingly. Okay. Put on those lips. Let's use a different lead weight, 4B. Upper lip is a downturn plane. All right, now side view, let's pull the, pull that midline over. Let's check it out again. One, two, three, close enough. So we're gonna continue that mid, the logic of the midline again. We're also gonna bring that vertical trace from the pupil and we're gonna look for a downturning angle on the lips in the side view. So we've got a downturning angle here, we've got a downturning angle on the lips, and then a stepping back from upper lip to lower lip. Again, just something to check. Then when we get to the chin, we're gonna go for an upturning angle, a front plane, and then we're back on Dickinson's triangle. All right, some, in, some other really important relationships to look for now that we've got that features of the side view starting to be filled out, is we wanna look at that tip of the nose to the tip of the chin. Always look for that angle. Always look for tip of the nose to the forehead. Always look for back of the glabella to the chin. Always look for the relationship of the ear to the nose, the ear to the eye line. Oh, we don't have an ear yet, so let's put the ears on. All right, uh, let's start, the ears are gonna be angled along with the jawline, so let's find the wide point of the jaw. That wide point of the jaw is gonna be at the midline of the lips. And what we're capturing there is that. And then that ear is going to follow the angle of the jaw. And we're going to place that ear halfway between the back of the skull and the back of the visible eye. And then I like to put the top of the ear right on my 
eye line, bottom of my ear, at the bottom of my nose in the true profile. Then as I place that ear in, I'm gonna think about four key features to look for. And then on any given model, I really wanna just uh, uh, pay very close attention to the shapes that I see there so that I can capture the feeling of that particular individual's ear. And those features are helix, which is that fold at the top, the antihelix, which is the form that is kind of bulges out in response to the helix. The tragus, this little form that sometimes people pierce. I think it's also an acupuncture point. And then the form that responds to it, tragus, I think they call it. I've been saying it wrong for years and years. Okay. I'll throw a little light and shade in there. And the antitragus. So those four parts. Lately in my schematic, I've been adding a little C up here. Just because it seems like so many people have that. All right. Now on the front view, we're going to allow that ear to just pop right outside our five-eyed cube. But I'm still going to think about just those four parts. Uh, helix, antihelix, Tragus, antitragus. Let's pull that down to the white point of the jaw. Try and feel out a little bit of Dickinson's triangle, that underside plane. There we have it. Let's since I've got you here, let's drop a five-eyed cube. Because if I take that five-eyed cube and I drop it one time, then that's going to get me, in this schema, the pit of the neck. So I'd like to come back a, a little bit. Then we're on to sternum. You know, sternum is made of manubrium and gladiolus. Those will go down. Uh, but what we're interested in, if we come back and grab that seventh vertebral spine, we've got another model here, seventh vertebral spine, pit of the neck, then that circle of the first rib is coming off of that uh, seventh vertebral spine. Then we can drive the neck through the circle of the first rib. So if we put our seventh vertebral spine, pull down that circle of the first rib. On, <clears throat> at the top of the manubrium, uh, then we've got the collarbone. We'll leave that off for now. But if we think about the spinal column, kind of gets a, a little bit of a S shape that's like bending to support the weight of the skull. As we go under the rib cage, we get another bending under to support that weight. And then we've got esophagus and trachea, and uh, they're gonna be driving right through that circle of the first rib. Then we've got a bone, a floater bone called the hyoid. The voice box, which is a kind of like shield-like form. Uh, we've got the strong cords coming down. 
And then also uh, uh, trapezius coming down for the back of the neck. Uh, and, you know, one of my favorites is sternocleidomastoid. It's kind of a muscle that spirals around. Another thing I always like to do in this demonstration is uh, make my schemas into a cyclops. It definitely needs an ear. And when we're putting an ear, we'll just think about those four parts. Helix, antihelix, tragus, antitragus. All right. Thank you for your time. We're signing off from Fourth Culture Studios, where there's culture, there's counterculture, there's the reactionaries. And then there's us. We're trying to do it a little bit different. See you next time.